All right, good morning. Good morning. Rosh Hashanah. Um, who knows what Rosh Hashanah is off the top of your head besides David? The Jewish, what is it? Okay, Feast of Trumpets, Jewish New Year. And uh, believe it or not, it's got a lot of significance. I mean, it has a, a lot of significance. Good morning. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning before we actually celebrate Rosh Hashanah. So, just some housekeeping items coming up the next few weeks. We're going to talk about the uh, rapture of the church. We're going to start bleeding into the rapture of the church next week. Because next week, we're going to, and the rapture of the church is not going to be one lesson. It's going to be several lessons because you cannot sum up a doctrine like that in 30 to 45 minutes. So, for next week, and I don't think I put, uh, yes I did actually on the next slide. We're going to talk about, the, start talking about the rapture of the church. We're going to start talking about Matthew 24 and 21. And actually I should have put on here Mark 13. Um, we're going to turn, uh, talk about the current events of the Olivet Discourse, the Great Temple Discourse, which is what these two are. We'll begin Daniel's 70th week uh, in Israel's role in prophecy prior to the rapture. And as we get on, get on into this study, we'll get what is Israel's real role. According to Daniel 9, where Daniel 9 says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. And who was thy people? That was Daniel's people to bring an end to iniquity. Okay, to bring in everlasting righteousness. And we'll get into that a, a, a lot deeper. But this is just a sneak preview of what's coming up. We're probably going to spend about three or four weeks or more on the rapture of the church. And the different theories. I'm not going to just preach at you pre-trib rapture. Because I'll be very honest. I'm not 100% in the pre-tribulation rapture camp. I'm not... I am I'm 0% in a post-tribulation rapture camp for reasons you guys will see. It will be very obvious to you, Daniel 9 being one of the reasons. However, uh, there are several possibilities that I'm open to, and we'll discuss all of those. So, for next week, Revelation 4. Revelation 4. And... That, those first two verses especially you're going to want to really pay attention to because uh, that, that's a, it's going to be important. And begin prep work. Now this is your reading assignment, but it's not necessarily for this next week. I know some of you guys are having some hard times getting your assignments done because you got life going on, right? You know. Uh, yes. And Vanessa knows I pick on her, so y'all don't feel sorry for her at all. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't know why, you know. Just be John Good. She got picked on by Bobby Good all the time. Yeah. Didn't she? Mercilessly. Yeah. Just wait till you get home. Uh, yeah. That's basically what happened. Good morning, guys. Come on in and grab a seat. We need chairs, honey. Uh, there's, one there's, chair. there's one chair there. There's more. Okay. Uh, so there's your prep work. Now, if you guys will read these four chapters... And I should have actually put on there Matthew 25 as well. Matthew 24 and Matthew 25. Just spend some time over the next few weeks reading these and just meditating on them. Don't read them to read them. Read them to let it soak into you. Uh, and actually, I will try to get something printed out for you. What I did was last, uh, when was that, Friday or Thursday, whenever it was, I actually sat down and put Matthew 24, 25, Mark 13, and Luke 21 in an order because they talk about a lot of the same things, but there's some verses from different books that are a little different. They have a little bit more detail. So what I try to do is put them all in an order, and uh, I'll have that for you guys uh, maybe next week. So that's your reading assignment. Everybody got that copy down? And I'll send it out in the email too. Uh, but it's just real important that you read these things over the next few weeks and get some good background information. Okay? All right. So while we're here, Lashana Tovah. That's, that's the Lashana Tovah. That is the greeting on Rosh Hashanah. Okay? You don't say Happy Rosh Hashanah. That's, 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 that's real <laughs> Greek of you. Okay? Uh, hey. Heathen, read that's Scythian, whatever you want to be. If you're gonna say it Jewish, it's it's Lashana Tovah, and that's actually a a, a the, the Greek I mean sorry, see I got Greek on the brain. 
the uh, the Jewish greeting is actually very long, and I'm not going to do that because I don't want to embarrass myself, first of all, and y'all wouldn't get it in second place. But this is the summary, and it means just for a good year because Rosh Hashanah is the, the new year. Now, it, well, as we'll see, it's not the civil new year because Tishri 1, which is Rosh Hashanah, is the seventh month. But it's a, it, it means much more than just a new year. So what is it? Okay? Yom HaZikarim. It's a day of remembrance. Okay? That is one of... Now, you will never see the words Rosh Hashanah in the Hebrew Bible. Or even in an English translation. Okay? You won't see that. And you will not see Festival of Trumpets. Because that's the Christian... Kind of what we've done with Christmas. Okay? And what we've done with Easter is a better example. You know, Jesus did not celebrate Easter. He celebrated Passover. And part hey, and part of church history, the problem, one of the problems I have with church history is that we have separated it. That we celebrate Easter on an entirely different time than Passover. Sometimes they line up and sometimes like next year they're a month off. And that bothers me to no end because we miss the symbolism of what Easter all of, and what the Passover was all about. And we'll talk about that just briefly. It's also called Yom Teruah. Yom Teruah. And that just simply means a day of blowing or a day of sounding the trumpet. It's the shofar. So uh, in the Hebrew, you will actually see it ref, uh, referred to in Leviticus as Yom Teruah. So Rosh Hashanah is just something, it's kind of like what we've done, like I said, with Passover. We put, we've called it Easter. Um, and here's Leviticus 23. This is one of your homework assignment. Speak to the people of Israel saying in the seventh month, not the first month, right? The first month is, who knows the first, huh? April, March. It's close, I'm talking in Hebrew. Nisan. Nisan. Okay, oh. not the thing you drive. <laughs> but the month. That's a Nissan. Yeah, that's a Nissan, according to top of your guys. British, yes. Okay, so speak to the people of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall observe a solemn day of rest, a memorial proclaimed with the blast of trumpets, a holy convocation. And that's Yom Teruah. Okay? And there's not a whole lot of information about the Feast of Trumpets in the Bible. There's just not. Uh, so we call it in Christianity the Feast of Trumpets. And Rosh Hashanah literally means the head of the year. That's when we say Rosh Hashanah, or as many of you probably say Rosh Hashanah. That's the Anglicanized version. That's okay. You know, we're, we're not going to get all crazy here. Um, it means the head of the year. And it marks the spiritual new year. Not the calendar new year, not the civil new year, which was Nisan 1. But Tishri 1 is the head of the spiritual new year. And it celebrates and commemorates the creation of man. So it's the Tishri 1, the seventh month. Anybody get that it's the seventh month? What has been the theme of this class? Seven. Okay, because seven is God's complete perfection. It's his perfect number. All right. On the seventh day he rested, that's right. So this is the seventh month. So it goes to figure that, hey, this is a special month, you know. Rosh Hashanah begins as what is known as the ten days of awe, which ends on Yom Kippur, where God judges his creation. Now, I get tingles when I think about God's perfection and how he organized all of this. Um, and the ten days of awe which is beginning today what we will be in. We will be in what is known in the Hebrew nation as the 10 days of awe because historically bad things happen during this time for Israel. So when you're, when you're thinking about is Israel going to be betrayed, hmm, the UN votes next week on the Palestinian state issue. We're in the 10 days of awe. The Pope comes and may declare a Palestinian state in front of the UN, which is some of the rumors, he is going to do that on Yom Kippur. I'm sure, that's a coincidence. Yeah, it's all a coincidence. That's right. And it starts on Monday. Well, we're going to get there. 
So Rosh Hashanah <coughs> begins, okay, so here's the story. Vanessa told me this morning, she said, you know, by the way, that, that Rosh Hashanah doesn't start until tomorrow. I went, not oh. so. <laughs> okay. Again. No, you're not always wrong. <laughs> Most <Right>? of <laughs> See, guys, it's not just y'all. And ladies, it's that. So, see? Yeah. Okay. There's sunset. Remember, Hebrew time starts at sunset. Who was it this morning that says we kind of start when we get up? I think that was Gina. Gina said that, yeah. And But Hebrew time starts at sunset. So sunset today in Jerusalem is 1048 Rosharon time. So right at the beginning of the service, uh, and unfortunately, we've got to go. I've got to work, uh, and I'm actually, my guys are working right now. God bless you. Um, at 1048, so while I'm driving to work, the Jewish New Year, the spiritual New Year, Rosh Hashanah starts, and you guys will see how important that is and how it's going to change the way you view the first three minutes of the service today, or actually right before the service, I promise you. Yom Kippur begins on Tishri 1, uh, I'm sorry, Tishri 10, that should be Tishri 10, which is Tuesday the 22nd of September at 10.36 a.m. That's when Yom Kippur starts, and that is 10.36 Rosh Hashanah time. And Yom Kippur is a, a, a day of mourning. Most of the bad things happen in the days of awe, but most of them of those happen on Yom Kippur. Yes, sir. And we have a solar eclipse. And we have a solar eclipse that day. Which solar eclipses have always been used in the scripture as signs of dealing with the nations. Anything that deals with the moon deals with Israel. Anything that deals with the sun deals with the Gentile world. Just like any time in the Bible, uh, when you see a word symbolically, figuratively used, and you know, like in Revelation 13, the beast comes out of the sea. Anytime you see the word sea, in the scripture being used symbolically, it means the nations. Anytime you see the land, like the false prophet comes from the land, that's Israel. That's how we know, pretty sure, if you know your Old Testament, this is where some people get off the wagon here and get, you know, get off the track and, and, and crash. They don't know their Old Testament. So they, they think, well, the false prophet or the, the, um, the beast, the Antichrist, is going to be a Jew. Wrong. He comes out of the sea. False prophet is going to be this guy. He's going to be the Pope. He's going to no. The false prophet says he comes from the land. He can't be the Pope. Pope the Pope's not Jewish. Okay, so that's why all of this is important. All of this it, it means something, guys. And, and Yom Kippur it starts on the twenty second of September, and we'll talk a little bit about that next week. I'm going to briefly discuss Yom Kippur. So all of this culminates culminates with Sukkot. It's the Feast of Tabernacles. And that is an extremely important day. Because, what does John 1 say? John 1, 14. You might know it off the top of their head. And the Word became flesh and? Okay, in the literal Greek, what does it mean? The Word became flesh and? Tabernacled with us. I believe that is John saying that this is Jesus fulfilling the Feast of Tabernacles because that is what the feast did. They dwelt in booths. They dwelt in temporary vessels. And we'll get into the, some of that too. So if you want to know when Jesus' birthday was, it was probably the Feast of Tabernacles, 2 B.C., roughly 2 B.C. On September 30th, I'm sorry, September, I, I just got a net. September 20th was, and we know this, we'll, we'll get into that later, okay? But we know this because of, you remember what I said in the Bible, guys? Everything's there for a reason. And remember when Zechariah was in the temple and it says he was of the course of Avaya? That's a very obscure little passage. You know, that's important. It, it's not just giving you some information about Zechariah and what he's doing in the temple. The course of Abaya, when we count backwards, we know that these priests were in there during certain courses, and we know, therefore, that Abaya, when he got the word that his wife was pregnant, that that was in the spring. And actually in the winter, I'm sorry. And so we know, therefore, that John, when John was conceived, and we know that Jesus was conceived six months later, and therefore we count forward and we come to the fact that 
Gee, amazingly, Jesus' birthday fell around the Feast of Trumpets that year. I mean, sorry, the Feast of Tabernacles. And given how the Feast of Tabernacles is presented in the Old Testament, we probably can see that this is what Jesus fulfilled the Feast of Tabernacles for the first time. We'll talk about that in a second. So Jesus' birthday was probably September 20th, which coincidentally is our anniversary. And we actually, I actually knew this before. No, I, we didn't find out about it until after we got married. So it's not something I, I, I rigged, you know, just to say, oh, cool, well, Jesus, and we care, you know. So according to tradition, during the days of Ah, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, God judges all creatures. So what the tradition says is that on Rosh Hashanah, God judges everyone in this room and everyone in the world to determine whether their names are written in the book of life for that year. That's the, we know that God has a bigger book than that and can see more in the future than that. But that's the tradition. So people fall between the two categories, have until Yom Kippur to perform teshuva or repentance. So that's what you will see a lot of Jews repenting during this period of time because they're like, oh, I don't know if I'm written in that book. So I've got 10 days to get it right. And that's what the days of awe are, is to look introspectively at yourself. And that's what's important. So Rosh Hashanah and the 10 days of awe to Yom Kippur are to be a time of reflection. So I challenge you for the next 10 days to, to use this time as a time of reflection on who you are as a Christian. Where is your prayer life? Where is your love of the Lord? Where is your war room attitude? Great movie. I wish, I wish more of you guys would have seen it. And if you didn't get to go last night, I understand. But I'm begging you to go see this movie. I'm begging you. You will be blessed. And it's not just that you're going to walk out feeling good. I hope you walk out feeling like, oh, Lord, I've got some things i got to straighten out. Okay, that's what the movie is all about. So the, the 10 days are to uh, reflect on your life, to repent, and dedicate your life to holiness. That's what Rosh Hashanah is all about. It's also a time when the exiles returned from Babylon and when Ezra, Ezra gathered the people to read the Torah. When we, we read that in Nehemiah and Ezra, uh, that that happened on Rosh Hashanah because it's a time of renewal. It begins the fall feast. It begins the time when fall feast will be fulfilled. We know the spring feasts were fulfilled by and large in Jesus' first coming. Passover, his death, unleavened bread, the time in the tomb. Uh, you know, the feast of first fruits, that's his resurrection. Uh, Pentecost, that's his, uh, the, the giving of the Holy Spirit. So, we have a whole bunch of feasts in the fall that nothing's happened on except for the Feast of Tabernacles. So, therefore, it's logical to assume that Jesus' second coming, which, by the way, is what we're studying, right, in Revelation, will fulfill, these things will be fulfilled somehow with these feasts and fasts. So the spring feast fulfilled his first coming. Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Tabernacles fulfilled the second. With Tabernacles, probably a double fulfillment. Tabernacles will be his first coming and his second coming. When he tabernacles with men for all eternity. Setting up the millennial reign of Christ. That is probably going to happen on the Feast of Tabernacles. So... <clears throat> Sounding on the shofar is essential. <clears throat> it's very, very important to Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. There are four trumpet blasts in the sounding of the shofar for Rosh Hashanah. The tekiah, which is a long blast. The shevarim, which is three short blasts. The teruah, which is nine staccato blasts. <laughs> Y'all hear this in a second. Tekiah gadola, a very long blast as long as that can be sounded. There in all, there are 100 blasts coming during Yom Teruah. So on Rosh Hashanah, there was 100 blasts done. The last blast is the Tekiah de Gola, is what I want to talk about. This is cool. <laughs> now, why don't we study the Hebrew fasts and feasts? Why are we ignorant? Because people have taken Colossians 2.16 to an extreme. Because it says, let no man judge you. So you should not be judged for not celebrating Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, Passover. Because there it is right there. With regard, don't let any man judge you. 
But some have taken it to the extreme by ignoring it. And we forget one simple fact, that all of these things are a shadow of Christ. Remember, the Old Testament, Jesus is at the cross. And there is a bright light in front of the cross. And there's a shadow that's cast into the Old Testament. And the people in the Old Testament could only see the shadow. They didn't know what was causing the shadow. <clears throat> they could only see these feasts and these fasts and these laws and all of these things. And they didn't realize that it was Jesus on the cross casting that shadow back. And that all of these things mean something. So why should we celebrate it? Well, first of all, Rosh Hashanah, and unfortunately we can't do the whole thing because it's actually a meal. And it's a it's several hours ordeal and we don't have that kind of time. But it's a rehearsal for the, for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Rosh Hashanah is a dress rehearsal. Every time you celebrate Rosh Hashanah, you're, you're, you're practicing for the marriage supper of the Lamb because that's what the marriage supper of the Lamb is going to be. And believe it or not, this was also part of your reading in Zechariah 14 because one day you will celebrate this in the kingdom. Read Ezekiel 40 through 47 and Zechariah 14, 16 through 21. Matter of fact, in Zechariah 14, you will see that every nation is going to be required to celebrate what I think is Jesus' birthday. Jesus is going to have a birthday party at the, at the uh, Feast of Tabernacles. Okay? And every nation is going to be required to go there. And if they don't, they're going to be punished. So why is it this one? Why is it Feast of Tabernacles? Because it's probably Jesus' birthday. Every year, Jesus is going to have a birthday party. A great birthday party. And everybody's going to go be required to celebrate the birthday party of the king. And so why should we do this? Because you're going to do it for all eternity. So why not practice now? You know? And one of our premises of studying Revelation is that we do not understand Revelation or Bible <clears throat> prophecy in general if we do not know our Old Testament. So if we don't see how all of this lines up, we can't really understand the New, the New Testament prophecies or even the Old Testament prophecies if we don't know how to study what happened in the Old Testament and we don't know what these things mean. Rosh Hashanah is a festival in which no man, it was known as no man knows the day or the hour. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. It's also called the hidden day. Because see, Rosh Hashanah is the only, the only holiday in which the day is not known. Because you never knew when the moon was actually going to form a crescent. You didn't know if it was going to be today or tomorrow. Through modern technology, we know these things. But you never knew if that crescent moon was going to form today or tomorrow. And so they had a guy on a wall, several guys, and as soon as they saw that crescent moon, they blew the trumpet. But you never knew when it was going to happen. See, the ninth, the, the, the ninth of Av, you knew that that was going to be on the ninth day of Av. Okay? Uh, Yom Kippur, you knew that was on the 10th of Tishri. So you had already started counting. Passover, 15th of Nisan, you knew all of these things. But you never knew when the Feast, of Trump, the Feast of Trumpets was going to happen. It's called the day in which no man knows the day or the hour. That is what we're going to talk about. The Takiya de Goa, Godola, is called the Last <coughs> Trump. Now, these should seem very familiar with you. Because in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, it says, The Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of God, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and that is known as the rapture, the rapture of the church. And in 1 Corinthians 15.52, we see, In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet. Now, we'll talk about that in a second. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. And Matthew 24, 31 says he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now some say the last trumpet is actually the seventh, seventh, uh, seventh trumpet judgment of Revelation eleven fifteen, 15. And let me explain to you why I don't believe that is possible. Uh, let me go back there. Um, the reason why I don't think that's possible is because John's revelation didn't happen until like 40 years after Paul's revelation. Paul had no idea that there were trumpet judgments. So he, in context, he was saying something to people that they would understand. It's at the last trump. This rapture of the church, when I'm, ta when I'm talking to you, it's at the last trump. Well, in context, remember what we said about studying the Bible. If you don't understand something, look in the Greek and then project yourself back into the hearer's ears. So if I'm Paul 
and I'm speaking the last trump, and you're a bunch of Messianic Jews sitting around, you instantly know that that's Takiyah de Gola, Gadola, I'm sorry, Takiyah de Gadola. You know that. That's your context. We don't, because we've removed ourselves from the feast and the fast. So some think that it is possible that the rapture of the church occurs on Rosh Hashanah. Now, we talked about in previous class, no man knows the day or the hour. That was like class one or two. And we explained why that doesn't mean what you think it means. And we gave the Greek definition, so I'm not going to go into that. And if you guys miss it, it's in session one or two. I can't remember which one. But we talked about why that no man knows the day or the hour is just not some hidden reference. And now we see that, and I told you guys this was coming. Now we see that no man knows the day or the hour was a reference to Rosh Hashanah. Because they knew that. Oh yeah, no man knows the day or the hour. Oh, that's just like, that's like Rosh Hashanah. That's, you know, Yom Teruah is what they would have said. So, it's possible. So, with that being said, hypothetically, if the rapture of the church is on Rosh Hashanah, it could be today, it could be next year, and God may have a different plan, okay? Rosh Hashanah may be fulfilled by something else. So I'm not saying that this is going to happen at 1048. Don't, get, don't, don't go there, all right? But I do believe that the last trump is found in the, uh, in the blowing of the shofar. And I believe that it is likely that what you are going to hear right before the rapture of the church is this. chills yeah imagine so i don't think you'll hear the shavarim and you know tarua and all that i think you'll just hear the blast so if you're ever walking around and you start hearing trumpet blasts you've got about a minute and a half to get really geeked up excited because when that last trumpet is sounded the long one and it's not some man blowing this this is the angel of God. You know he's got some big lungs. And his lips ain't going to get sore. And then we're gone. I honestly believe that that's what the last trump is. Now whether or not it's on Rosh Hashanah, I don't know. Everything The empirical evidence seems to suggest it may be. We don't know. But I honestly believe that is what that last trump is going to sound like. And I think... 
that we're going to have a little, there, it's going to take maybe that trumpet blast, those, those 99 blasts, to resurrect the dead in Christ. Remember, they rise first, and then we, in a twinkling of an eye, are gone. And by the way, the twinkling of an eye is actually an, Amer an empirically measured piece of time, and it's how long it takes light to travel from your lens to the back of your eye. That's a twinkling. So knowing that light travels at 186,000 miles per second, it doesn't take that long to go from your eye lens to the back of your eye. That's a twinkling. So, so far is blown. No work is permitted. It's for repentance. <coughs> Eating apples and bread dipped in honey. Eating of the challah. And you will see on the collar bread that there are three braids. One is the kingship of God. One represents remembrance of what God has done. And one represents the revelation of God. And the shalif is the casting off of sin, which unfortunately we can't do because we don't have a creek running behind us. If we did, we would be out there right now. So let's celebrate.